sou professor aqui na Faculdade de Economia e investigador no CEP, alguns já conhecem, alguns, outros não, uh, e também coordeno o Observatório do Risco e já é o segundo ano em que temos esta iniciativa conjunta com o University College of London, o professor David Alexander, que é conhecido, mas é professor do University College of London e investigador no reconhecido Instituto for Risk and Disaster Reduction, o Instituto para a Redução do Risco e dos Desastres, do University College of London, que é o nosso parceiro nesta iniciativa nos próximos anos. Uh, foi uh, cientista-chefe do Fórum Global para o Risco de Davos, a iniciativa anual, uh, e também uh, é editor de, 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 da revista International Journal of Disaster Risk Reduction, que é uma referência uh, na área. Tem publicado vários artigos e livros, o último dos quais tenho aqui, há uma cópia, esta é minha, mas há uma cópia da Faculdade do SES, How to Write an Emergency Plan como escrever um, um plano de emergência que tem em conta as diferenças culturais, uh, etc. Até porque o professor uh, David foi coordenador da Proteção Civil do Sul de Itália durante muitos anos. Uh, já me disse, mas depois irá falar, que vem a seguir, um, o próximo livro será sobre a gestão de emergência, não um plano, um plano de gestão uh, de emergência. O professor também é uh, cofundador e uh, do Instituto of Civil Protection and Emergency Management, o Instituto de Proteção Civil e de Gestão de Emergências, que faz o seu encontro anual todos os anos em junho, e que será agora neste junho que eu estarei lá, que é a reunião das entidades de proteção civil da, da Grã-Bretanha. Uh, por último, é professor visitante uh, nas Universidades de Burnham, Norton, Grand Derbia, uh, e também desde este ano na Universidade de Coimbra. Daí a sua lição à tarde é no âmbito de ser professor uh, visitante da Universidade de Coimbra. A professora Fátima é membro honorário do Bartlett School of Architecture, Development Planning Unit, portanto, da Escola de Arquitetura da University College of London. É especialista, como vamos ver, em planeamento e gestão urbana e na elaboração de planos de reconstrução pós-desastres. Mais do que isso, fundou uma plataforma muito importante para se perceber o Médio e o Próximo Oriente, a Silk Cities Platform, a plataforma das cidades da seda, a antiga rota da seda, para aquele mais um documento histórico, e é diretor de uma instituição que é Civitas Phoenix, que o próprio nome acho que diz tudo. Também editou mais recentemente, em 2015, com Saeed Moeni, o livro Urban Change in Iran, portanto, a mudanças urbanas no Irã. E, without further delay, I will give the word to you. And if somebody wants to ask something in Portuguese in English, please uh, say that for the people. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you here. Okay, bom dia. Um, there's a text called Power Play of Paul. No, now, what did I learn in Portuguese? Is it that, but Italian will, you speak? I will have to <laughs> use an Italianist. Uh, but I will try to speak uh, clearly in English. And uh, I apologize for not being able to speak in, in your language at present. Um, I wrote this um, as a follow up to a book called Principles of Emergency Planning and Management. Principles it was because I did not want it tied to particular systems. Most of the books in this field are American and they work in America, they do not work in other countries because the system is different. However, the feedback from the earlier book published in 2002 suggested that people wanted a book that was more practical and I have met many people who are pushed into the role of emergency planner or manager without the training. So the idea was to write a book that as comprehensively as possible explained some of the issues and the models of planning for emergencies. My approach is not the only approach, there are others that are equally valid, but that's the way it is. I now have a contract to write another book called How to Manage an Emergency. My wife says I am hopeless at managing emergencies. However, that doesn't stop me writing about it. <laughs> anyway, because this is to be a symposium about new technology, um, I am going to talk about social media um, because they are one of the quintessential forms of new technology 
and potentially very important in both positive and negative ways to managing crises, emergencies and disasters. I was sitting at my desk in Italy and it began to move at precisely two minutes past nine on the 29th of May 2012. And the desk lamp began to move in the opposite direction and I thought to myself, this feels like somewhere it is a large emergency, a large earthquake, and it was. So I got onto the internet, which was still perfectly functional, and within 50 minutes I had a clear idea of what was going on, because firemen were tweeting, we had Twitter reports from members of the public, and even the Bishop of Ferrara was tweeting in his cathedral. So it turned out that the social media picture that emerged through a newspaper, La Repubblica, uh, by simply relaying the tweets, was substantially accurate. And that is quite remarkable. In less than an hour, even if you were in Antarctica, you could find out what was happening, uh, and accurately. On the other hand, one month after this, I was in Kent in Belgium at the fire department, the fire brigade headquarters, talking to the fire chief about this event, which was an explosion that killed someone and a toxic cloud, well it was the toxic cloud that killed the person, and it was a major emergency requiring evacuation and it took a week to put things right. But the social media reports, the fire chief told me, were wildly inaccurate and they had serious problems because they did not have accurate information that they could put on social media to counter the speculation, the rumour and the inaccurate reports. Firstly, they did not know what the substance was or how toxic it was. It took time to find that out. And then they really couldn't say when the emergency would end because there was a serious fire. This is the end of it, not the beginning. Um, and various other things con connected with contamination. So social media, according to this fire chief, were a problem. But we have come a very long way. When I was young, you went down to the telephone box, you put money in, you pressed a button, and you asked to be connected. Uh, we did not have telephones at home, mostly. And now, well, that is the first generation of mobile telephone in Boston, Massachusetts. Generation one. Look at it. We've come a very long way very quickly, but have we assimilated the technology? Quarantelli, who has just died at the age of 92, uh, said he was the, the great sociologist of disaster said that the information technology revolution is of prime importance. It is as important as previous great cultural revolutions, such as the invention of writing, printing, and so on. But he also says that if you look at the technology, it leads two lives, the official life and the very unofficial life. Technology does what it is supposed to do, but it also does something quite different that is not expected of it. And if you look at the state of world affairs, Donald Trump, the French election, anything, you will see that there is surely some truth in this. And that technology has become rather unpredictable, despite attempts to bring it under control some of which are legitimate and some of which are definitely not legitimate. So, I like this diagram. I think it was invented by Yi Fu Tuan, who was a Chicago geographer and philosopher. And he said, if it were he, if he were the originator anyway, um, that communication starts with data. The basic facts. On their own, they are neutral and they don't mean much on their own. In fact, they mean almost nothing. 
So we combine them into information. We put them together. Description of facts and statistics and so on. Situations. That gives us some explanatory power. Knowledge is the further development of information. What can we do with information to understand the world? And the smallest part, right at the top, is wisdom. The ability to make decisions on the basis of everything that is beneath. Knowledge, information, data. So, we need wisdom. We need it badly. We need it more and more. But will we get it? And what is the contribution of social media to this? You will probably think, and rightly, that the contribution is much greater at the lower levels than it is at the top levels. I think that is the case. But maybe that would be inevitable. But nevertheless, information and communications technology is right at the heart of what we do now. It has flattened the chain of command. It has increased public participation, perhaps, not in all cases, but perhaps it has democratized civil protection. It certainly has the potential to do that. And it has revolutionized how we do respond to and manage disasters. And of course, it is also revolutionizing research. Vast amounts of work are now underway on the technological implications or rather the implications of technology for disaster response, mitigation and recovery. So social media, what are they? Let's remember blogs, bookmarking, networking, forums, collaborative work, wikis for example, and sharing things largely by different platforms, different algorithms and different means. In a sense, social media are not even a group. They are so diverse. So it is quite hard to talk about social media if they were a single phenomenon. Nevertheless, the age of the selfie. <laughs> social media. Um, they don't have a centre. Now in the past, and indeed still, we are used to the idea that there is a centre. If you want to know about something connected with national civil protection, I presume you go to Lisbon and you go to the national headquarters and you know where the centre is. But where is the centre of social media? Well, you could say perhaps it is Google headquarters or Facebook headquarters. Well, yes and no, but not everything that they offer is under control, very clearly. So, no absolute centre. They do not produce a consensus, an absolute consensus. Yes, there are consensuses, but there are always dissenters, people who disagree in social media, with absolutely everything. Uh, yeah. So, we have moved to a world with a different architecture of knowledge. Before you report it on the situation, you turn that into an article, you put it in your newspaper, you sold it, people bought it, and they read it. Now what? Well, it is a truly open system where things come and go, where things appear and disappear with citizen journalism and with the management of knowledge by nobody in particular. Yes, we have moderators, but mostly their job is simply to exclude some of the uh, most offensive material, not even to ensure quality in social media. In fact, what is quality in social media? That is a very complex question. So, let's look at what we know about social media emergencies and disasters. There is a vast amount of research going on at the moment because this is a very popular topic with young students. Firstly, how are social media used technically? Um, there is a technical issue about the design of algorithms, hardware, and software. 
Secondly, how are social media used socially? In other words, how do people actually exploit or make use of social media? So those are the two fundamental questions which we need to answer in relation to emergencies and disasters. In disasters, social media have a variety of different uses. They can disseminate warnings or other messages or alerts. Um, the assumption is that even if not everybody has direct, constant access to social media, enough people will receive the alert to be able to socialise it and to um, assist people who have not received it. And there are studies in Australia that suggest that even people, for example, the extremely uh, elderly people over the age of 90, they have no computer, they don't use the phone even, even they can benefit from social media indirectly. Um, social media help locate missing people. There are algorithms for that, Google has one. Disseminate information to the public. Now, if you are running a civil protection service that is in direct contact, or should be in direct contact with the public, then really you ought to think about the public's use of social media. Because that could otherwise be a hole in your system where you are trying to tell people things and you are not using the right medium, the medium that they use to garner information. Citizen journalism, in other words, that people will collaborate to share their stories and build up a picture of the situation. It may be an accurate or an inaccurate picture, as we saw in the opening examples. Stimulate cash donation. Nowadays, the internet and social media are extremely important in terms of the way that people donate money to causes. This can have very beneficial effects or effects that are quite the opposite, causing imbalances of an economic nature. Um, let's remember the 2004 um, tsunami. Well, that was before the social media um, age, really, which started in the second half of the 2000s. But even there, the publicity given to the tsunami, the sense of involvement of people who had been tourists from rich countries, who had been tourists in the Indian Ocean, coastal areas, and so on, meant that it was the biggest donation event ever, with 4.52 billion US dollars of donation, at the same time that unpublicized disasters with immense suffering, such as the situation in Darfur, Sudan, did not receive any money, or very little, when they needed it. And then collaboration, forms of collaboration on mapping, on emergency planning, and potentially on emergency management. Anyway, um, here's an example, Ushahidi. And this, uh, which is Swahili for testimony, is a platform and a company that offers the opportunity to crowdsource emergency plans. And it was used in Haiti in 2010, and it has been used elsewhere. Uh, it comes from Kenya, and in fact, Ushahidi have several products that they offer the world which can be transformed, utilized, adapted, and crowdsourced in order to manage emergencies. I don't think we as yet have an independent, fair evaluation of how really genuinely useful this is, but we will probably have one sooner or later. Anyway, information. Along comes the disaster, and we have this situation in which initially information is critical but lacking. What has happened? Where? What are the needs? Where are the needs? And that we do not know initially for a certain period. It may be minutes, hours, days, or weeks. There will be information all the time. There will be vast fluxes of information how much of that information is what is genuinely needed. 
But we have a shortage of the needed information that very rapidly turns into a surplus, indeed an excess of that information. And in that, one of the great needs is actually verification. In other words, the information received, is it true? Is this actually a fair, reasonable picture of the situation? Social media have their uses in verification, but so far it has been the weak point. You receive information, but is it the right information? Is it accurate? Is it objective? Is it correct? Or is it wrong? Social media in disaster have about nine different functions. The first of these is a listening function. If we want to know what people are thinking, then one way to do that is to tune into social media, Twitter for example, Facebook and so on, and see what is trending, what is happening, what are the key words. There are algorithms for this, I'm not sure they're terribly effective, but there are algorithms, and that's to automate it. And of course you can set up a listening post, the American Red Cross have one, they simply monitor to see what's going on. Uh, and in that, you progress from simply listening to what's trending to monitoring the quality, the nature, the direction of the public debate. What are the public concerned about? What matters to the public? That could be very important if we want to manage the public or communicate with the public. Thirdly, we can integrate social media into emergency management as part of the information service. There really is a two-way flux in social media. If you are the authorities, you get information, but you can't give information. So we need to think about how to do that. We can collaborate and crowdsource development with social media. That has been done in mapping and emergency planning, we can try at least to create social cohesion, therapeutic initiatives, look after the elderly, uh, using social media to ensure that we don't forget people with disabilities, and so on. And then again, donation or the furtherance of causes, and that usually, one way or the other, involves money. And research, let's not forget research. As I said, there is a very great trend towards more research, and research is very popular in this, because if we are to understand the modern public, we need to use every means available, and social media are precious, valuable in that sense. So, but of course, social media have a dark side, a negative side, and let's look at that. Firstly, rumor propagation. In other words, things that either aren't true or potentially aren't true, that get taken as fact simply because the statement, the information, is reproduced over and over again until it starts to assume the status of a fact simply because everyone is saying it. Conspiracy theories are an example of this, and there are plenty of those. Rumor propagation. Well, some early Japanese research in 2011, after the tsunami, earthquake, and Fukushima, suggested that rumors are counteracted by people who want to tell the true story. So you have someone who propagates a rumor, either through ignorance or through a desire to do something bad, and then you have someone else who says, hey, everyone, this isn't true. Well, okay, that may be the case, or it may not. Other research seems to suggest that rumor propagation is a bigger problem. It is not necessarily self-correcting. Conspiracy theories, and also um, weird ideas or anti-scientific ideas. For example, if you Google earthquake prediction, what sites do you get? Well, you get the US Geological Survey, reliable information of a scientific nature, and then you start to get the sites of people who predict earthquakes with the stars, with tea leaves, with cards, with whatever you like. And they are capable of producing websites that look just as good 
as the US Geological Survey's website. So social media can propagate that idea. Circulating false information, really part of the same theme. Charlatan sites, as I've just mentioned. Deliberate personal attacks and defamation can, of course, ruin the reputation of key players in this field if they are not kept under control. And how much can we keep such things under control? Trolling is the word used. Image manipulation as well is common. It's very, very easy to do. You can take um, Photoshop or Coral Draw or something like that and you can use the clone function and totally change a photograph without it being obvious. Uh, if you're very clever at it, you cannot detect the changes in it. And that can change the situation in the picture. But there and again, the conventional media are uh, just as good at distorting the story. This was a train crash. How many people died? 50, 100, 170? Well, actually, 31. <laughs> right? So, this is the way that even conventional media can just in the same way go over the top. So in the age of false information, how are we to get at the truth? Well, anyway, when we design systems to manage emergencies, information has to be an integral and critical part of the system. There is direct communication, although a call center cannot easily manage public demand. For example, when bombs went off in London in 2005, they set up a call centre and they received 40,000 calls in four hours. So uh, 10,000 calls an hour. Now obviously most of those calls are not answered because the average duration of a call that is answered is 12 minutes. So total failure in cases like that. Well, you can nevertheless use social media as a mass communication means where you can try to uh, answer frequently asked questions or something like that. And you can also use the mass media as we have done traditionally. Social media, in a sense, sit in the centre of this with connections to all parts of this system. But we cannot afford to ignore information management or social media. In London we have simulations, desktop simulations. We sit around the table, there are the people with the stripes on their shoulder and we the academics sit and watch them. And what do we find? Well we found in the last two of these simulations, one was a marauding shooter, terrorist, the other was a big storm, um, that the decision makers in the services, ambulance, fire, police and so on, really don't know how to manage the public. They see the public as a nuisance. The public are a problem. They are pawns to be moved about the chessboard. And unfortunately that is not how it really is. The public are the people we are doing this for. The public, we are we're only here because we're trying to protect the public. And the public has a mind of its own. The public will do what it wants to do. And so we tried to convince these decision makers that they really had to start thinking about what would the public do and the fact that the public will not necessarily take on trust what the decision makers say and do exactly as they are told. Command and control. Do you want to be commanded and controlled? I don't. So. And of course the problem with social media is that there aren't the so-called gatekeepers. We have these two horrible words, apple mediation and disintermediation. Terrible words. Um, the best we can do is group moderation, which is really a rather flimsy, light way of moderating the flow and the nature of information. It is in many ways unmoderated. So there we are um, in, in um, uh, stakeholders, these are they. There are organized stakeholders who are 
collected together, for example, a volunteer organization or an emergent group that comes out of a disaster, part of a disaster subculture. There are established groups such as the fire service or the Red Cross. And then there are spontaneous actions, perhaps by individual citizens or families or other social groupings, without incorporation into organizations. So that is my classification of social stakeholders. And the ones read in red are those where there is the greatest use of or potential for using social media. On the other hand, when we start studying this, we quickly find that much of what we're studying is not useful and it's not relevant and it doesn't help. As Re Re Rebecca Goolsby, who is a leading social media and disasters researcher, said, it's like searching for particles of gold in a raging river. In other words, almost all of what you're reading on Twitter is not helpful to you. It doesn't tell you much. And finding the bits that are helpful, that really gain insight is very difficult. So it's all about culture. We want a resilient culture, we want a culture of resilience at the same time. Technology in itself is innocent, but it's the way that it is used that makes it guilty, if indeed it is guilty. Technology is perceived as well as used, and so of course is the product of technology, the message, and perhaps even the plan that is behind that, although not often. And the way that this is interpreted depends on the culture which is involved. We have to try to understand that. Culture is very difficult to understand. Here's a model of culture. When you are born, after 20 minutes, you start to acquire culture by understanding your surroundings. But you inherit it from your forebears and your parents. As you grow, you accumulate it you fall into a cultural mold, or you start to acquire culture in such a way that you have your own culture, your cultural baggage. But we also have dynamic metamorphosis of culture. Much of that is now driven by universal technology. The mobile phone that is used here in Portugal, it's used by yak herders in Afghanistan or in Nepal, it's used by the Karamoji herders of Kenya, it's used in Argentina, it's used in Antarctica, in as much as it can be. Um, and that metamorphosis has both a scientific and objective side to it, and a thoroughly non-objective side as well. Does this help us? Well, one thing to remember is the value of symbolism. 500 years ago, when you see a comet in the sky and you say to yourself, ah, there's a comet in the sky, therefore there is going to be an earthquake. Symbolism, portent, prediction. But we still have it. It simply has changed character. And one reason why symbolism is so important is because information is so complex, it's the only way of simplifying it. That is why we have icons, very different from the original meaning of icon. But anyway, in all of this, we're moving slowly and at different paces in different places from a very vertical command and control way of managing emergencies to a much more flattened out participatory way. By the way, um, if you want to have copies of this diagram and, and other things, you can download them on your phone. Uh, there's a, a, a site you actually get your phone with, with this on it. Um, so what are our basic human needs? We have a new version of this coming out actually. There is another stratum and that is cheap flights, EasyJet Ryanair. They're going to go in there somewhere. <laughs> right. Well, there you are, basic physiological needs, battery. Sometimes we wonder whether emergencies are merely gigantic tests of the duration of batteries. And at the last emergency in London, the batteries ran out. Or rather, the last emergency that involved interruption of electricity supplies. They had hordes of spare batteries, they had extra charging facilities, they had ways around it, and it wasn't enough. 
I know this because we are now studying wide area electricity outages, which means no electricity over, say, half of Portugal. Is this impossible? Not at all. Not at all. The whole country could be without electricity. And if it did happen, you'd probably be without electricity for four days in some places. Um, but that's another story. So, in all of this, change is inevitable except from vending machines. But having said that, vending machines are actually the most resilient thing in Japan. You have this area flattened by a tsunami, and in the middle of it, you can buy a hot cup of green tea. <laughs> Extraordinary, isn't it? Anyway, thank you for your attention. One of these is the camera, and the other one is me. <laughs>